with an important topic, which is communication, because we said ask your developer is a really important mindset, but com the, we will see that communication is probably uh, as important as code. And for that, we have Scott Ford, CEO of Corgibytes with us, who join us. Hello, Scott, how are you? Hello, I'm good, how are you? Yeah, I'm good too, long time no see. And yeah. uh, actually, uh, yeah, I love the guitar, I love the, the, <laughs> the, the boards. Uh, so yeah, uh, the stage is yours and please share with us why communication is as important as code. All right, happy to. Um, yeah, so, you know, so this is a uh, this is me and my business partner uh, Andrea. Uh, we both went to high school together, and we became business partners after uh, getting in touch at our ten year high school reunion. And I'm kind of the stereotypical software developer, um, and and Andrea's Andrea's well, Andrea's kind of not the stereotypical software developer. Um, when we first started working together, Andrea was by far the better communicator between the two of us. Um, her degree was in uh, marketing and business law. And she had a ton of success working as a copywriter. Um, but she dove headfirst into the software development and really you know, wrapped her brain around it and already had a brain for solving problems in a programmatic ways. And so um, you know, learning the, the syntax and the grammar is, is really all that kind of you know, stood in her way to figure out how to solve problems that way. Um, and I've been trying to do similar work uh, when it comes to communication. Uh, so like you know, giving talks, uh, writing, writing articles, you know, trying to uh, improve my communication skills, trying to make sure that I can be uh, better understood through my writing. Um, and then as we went on this journey, we, you know, we've encountered a lot of different stereotypes along the way. Um, so as an example, uh, Andre and I were at a, a potential client meeting and Andre did almost all the talking at this meeting. And, and the questions she was responding to were, were highly technical questions. Um, but at the end of it, she was asked, so do you code? Um, and it wasn't the first time she got this question. Uh, it was just the first time that she was like super, super frustrated about it. Um, and so in response, <laughs> she got a tattoo on her wrist on the hand that she usually used to, to shake somebody's hand. Uh, and so now when somebody shakes her hand, they see this little code snippet, um, which, which uh, she interprets to, to mean she can be anything she wants to be, which I think is awesome. Um, and she doesn't get that question much anymore, <laughs> which is great. Um, and then, you know, on my side of the journey, I've also had to deal with some stereotypes. And it's a stereotype <laughs> that comes up a lot <laughs> in movies and in culture, and that's like that I'm not good talking to people. Uh, that I shouldn't be um, interacting with other humans. I should be interacting with the compiler or the you know the API to, to kind of tail in on the the last uh, speaker, um, and and to kind of emphasize that you know I'd be working for employers that hired someone specifically to to uh, act as a go between between me and the customer uh, that I wasn't. I wasn't trusted to speak directly with a customer, uh, the idea being that I would somehow mess things up. Um, and so I really started to, I really started to believe this. I really started to really ingest that and really think that like, I'm just not, I'm just not good at communicating. Um, and when Andre and I first started working together, uh, communication was kind of something that I just genuinely avoided. Uh, I would intentionally ignore emails. Um, and when I would write responses to them or would write them in general, um, I would keep them very short and they were very terse. Um, people uh, interpreted that as me being uh, offensive uh, when I wasn't trying to be. I was just, you know, very short with my words, um, and kind of like you know, focused on on efficiency. Uh, and I would also get really frustrated when I had to repeat myself. Uh, if I found myself uh, answering a question that I'd, I had already answered for for someone or for someone else, even uh, I would really start to get frustrated about that. Um, so Andrew really challenged me and she, and she pushed me to really explore uh, improving my communication skills by starting to look at them through the lens of the way that I have learned um, you know, software skills. And you know, she discovered that I was a really big fan and I'm really proud of the idea that I'm a polyglot de developer. So I'm a, I'm a developer who is comfortable working in a multitude of programming languages um, I'm not someone who just works in just one language. Uh, you know, I enjoy working in many different languages. And so, 
she pushed me and it and it's something that that I'd really push all of you who are watching to do as well was to not, add another language uh, to my tech stack and that was my team spoken language uh, and so depending on where you are in, in the world your team spoken language might be different than than your native language um, but you know diving in and getting really good at that at that language and understanding its nuance understanding its grammar, its syntax, its tone, its clarity, what it means for uh, information to be presented in a clean way. These are all attributes that we consider to be really important on our software systems, and they are also just as important when we're uh, composing paragraphs or descriptions or titles or you know captions for buttons. Um, we end up you know writing a lot as we're as we're writing code. Um, and if you kind of feel that communication isn't all that, isn't all that important, um, I'd kind of challenge you to consider the impact that communication can have on a code base. Because it turns out that the, the structures that you put in place in your code bases can really, really matter. Um, so at Corgibytes, uh, you know, the company that, that uh, Andre and I founded, um, we specialize in working with older neglected systems, uh, very much uh, the kinds of systems that the previous speaker was talking about. And we genuinely enjoy, with, with joy and glee, transforming those code bases into modern, clean uh, systems that look like they're brand new, even though they've been you know, slowly uh, transformed over time into something that's, that, that looks new and beautiful. Um, while doing this, we've noticed a theme over the years. Um, there is um, a pattern that's come up with that shows how communication has affected the development of these systems. And it can also be presented uh, when considering a systems law uh, that was developed by Mel Conway called Conway's Law. And at its most basic, it's the idea that the system that gets built by a software team is going to mirror the communication structure of that software team. Um, and I think this is a big contributor to why we end up with a lot of legacy projects. Um, it's not because the technology is bad. It's because the communication within the organization is poor. And so if the communication structures that led to that software system being created are poor, um, then the software system itself is, is going to suffer as well. Um, so many of the organizations that we've encountered over the years have also had a symptom that has shown up where they split people into two groups, where they have the technical people in one part of the organization, and they have non-technical people in the other part of the organization. But here's the thing is that like, if you're working for a company that's selling software or software services or, or software, you know, software as a service, um, you can't be non-technical. You have to understand your product um, no matter what role you have at the organization. So you have to be and. And even if you're technical, uh, if you're considered to be one of the technical people, you can't get away with, you know, just saying, "Oh, I'm technical. I'm I'm not supposed to know how to how to communicate." That's that's not realistic either. Everyone has to be both technical and not non-technical. So another thing that kind of comes up a lot is this idea of degree envy. And you know, I encounter many people. I've encountered many many people across my career um, who have entered the world of software development, but they haven't. Uh, gotten an education at university um, in computer science or computer engineering or software engineering or, or you know, a computing-related field. They come from biology or music or mathematics or, um, you know, accounting. You know, there, I've worked with you know, many, many amazing uh, software developers from a wide variety of fields, you know, be it art and design or theater, um, you know, like anyone can have a passion and develop the skills that it takes to be a really, really good programmer. Um, and so I, I really, whenever I encounter a degree in B, I really try to push against it and say, you know, you can be good at this even though you didn't get a degree in it. And that, <laughs> that also applies to me. <laughs> so, uh, and this is something that Andrea has, has really, you know, pushed me on is that, there, you know, there's no correlation between having a, having a college degree in communication uh, and being a good communicator. You can be a good communicator without having uh, 
a um, you know an English degree. You don't need to have studied tons and tons of literature to, to know how to communicate with other people. So, but it does take you outside of your comfort zone, and it's 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 when you're outside of that, that comfort zone that's when you really start um, seeing results. But let's let's take a we're going to take a really quick fast crash course into what communication is. Um, and it really starts by taking and considering the idea of empathy. And empathy is something that everyone has the, has the ability to learn and develop as a skill. Um, and it is developed by listening and understanding to others and uh, understanding their perspectives and then applying that perspective when making decisions. So, and, it, and again, it is a skill that, that you or anyone that you know can build. Um, and there are many different places that communication shows up in software. Um, you know, we have, you know, synchronous and asynchronous forms of communication. We have obvious and not obvious forms of communication. On the obvious side, we have, we have these forms. I'm not going to read over them for, for, for brevity. Um, on the not obvious synchronous side, you know, we have these, you know, when we're together face to face. But on the non obvious asynchronous side, this is where a lot of the artifacts that we produce while we're writing software start to show up, such as commit messages, the names we choose for our methods, uh, the, the content of uh, the scenarios that we, we create if we're using Cucumber or the test that we create if we're you know, using TDD, the messages we write in our pull requests or the, uh, the comments that we leave when we're reviewing someone else's pull request, uh, the message that we put in our timesheet so that our boss or our customer knows what we were working on when we spent those 4.7 hours um, you know, working on their project. You know, where, did, where did that time go? And then the error messages that we use to communicate with people when the software system encounters something they didn't understand. Um, that's also a communication artifact um, that kind of falls in that not, not obvious uh, department. So it's important to think of communication as just anything that's an artifact of your idea is communication. But that's not really different than code. So let's think of legacy code and, and a really good definition for legacy code uh, from Michael Feathers is that it's code without tests. Um, but my business partner, Andre, has improved upon that um, to say that legacy code is code without communication artifacts. So code without communication artifacts that support its existence and its continued existence. And this really, you know, kind of comes to, you know, the idea of archaeology and when you're working on an old software system, how you have to kind of dig through it to try to figure out um, what the developers of the past uh, were intending when they, when they worked on the system. It's a very similar challenge when you're working on a legacy system. Um, so, okay, why does all this matter? <laughs> so let's, uh, let, let's get to that. So what, what can you do? So this matters if you feel like you ever want to, to level up in your career. Do you want to move to the, to the next level in your career? Are you wanting to be a CTO one day? Are you wanting to be a lead developer one day? Are you wanting to land that architecture role, ar architect role one day? Um, then, you know, you need to, these are communication skills that you're going to have to take on, um, and you need to lean into this even though it's uncomfortable. Um, another big reason for focusing on communication is that it is the best tool for building trust between, between two individuals. Um, there's a you know, fantastic uh, book, uh, Daring Greatly by Brene Brown, that uh, presents this idea of a marble jar um, and that every time somebody does something nice for you, it's like a marble gets plopped in the jar, or every time you do something nice for somebody, that's a marble that gets plopped in the jar. And every time you frustrate them or don't take their feelings into consideration, then a marble comes out of the jar. And how many marbles are in that jar is a good measure of how much they trust you. So, you know, every interaction that you're engaging with, every communication artifact that you're creating for, for people and you're sharing with them, is that a communication artifact that's going to add marbles to the trust jar or is it going to be a communication artifact that takes marbles out of the trust jar? Uh, and there's also the idea of, like, <laughs> preventing fires. So there are many organizations where there are people who feel like their entire job is to just, you know, uh, triage issues that come up and, and, and put out fires from, from minute to minute. Um, and if you follow and practice good communication, you can prevent fires before they've ever started. Uh, at Corgibytes, one of our primary core values is calm the chaos. Um, we don't think you make the best decisions or build the best solutions when you're really stressed out and pumped full of adrenaline. 
Uh, we encourage our team members to to take breaks throughout the day if they need them. We encourage our team members if they've worked, uh, you know, a really long uh, evening the night before. We we encourage them to uh, to take some time off the next day. So you know, and by doing that, we're avoiding them making uh, making mistakes and and having those mistakes show up in our clients' code bases. So let's look at some patterns and frameworks that you can uh, employ um, to actually uh, you know, get some traction on, uh, on improving communication. So one is to like, acknowledge and notice context switching. So context switching is really frustrating. And the, the most frustrating phrase that I've ever heard uh, in my career as a software developer is, hey, do you got a second? <laughs> it just, it, it angers me to no end. Uh, I get so I get so frustrated that I feel like I want to flip the desk over, um, and the reason that I get so frustrated in that is because in my brain I have crafted this entire world that is a model of the software system that I'm working on, and the cognitive energy it takes for me to answer the question, "Do you have a second?" Um, you know, while answering that question, I see the entire universe that I've created just fall away. Uh, so we've introduced a framework at Quirky Bytes. Um, that we can call inception levels, where we use these to, to gauge how interruptible someone is. So if someone is, you know, if you ask them what their inception level is, so it's like how many dreams within a dream uh, are, are you within right now in, in, your, in your, you know, the palace that you've built in your mind. Um, if it's a zero or a one or a two, then you're interruptible. Outside of that, you're not interruptible. Uh, so you know, that's something that, we, that really, we really try to lean on. Uh, another thing that we uh, we try to pay attention to is uh, an, an idea that comes from uh, uh, well, I totally just blanked on the name of the show, <laughs> but it comes from a sitcom, uh, How I Met Your Mother. Sorry, uh, How I Met Your Mother, uh, and there is one episode where one of the characters, uh, uh, Ted, uh, all of his friends tell him just how often he says, "Well, actually," <laughs> uh, and they make this like little shattering glass and you know every anytime he tries to correct someone there's this like shattering glass sound effect that, the, that they play on the tv show so instead you know learn from tina fey and her book bossy pants and really practice yes and and her, her book has a really good um really good resources on you know what yes and uh, means and, and how to how to apply it really well feedback practice feedback without being mean this is hard <laughs> a really good framework for that um, is uh, Radical Candor, um, developed by, uh, by Kim Scott. Um, and the idea is to challenge someone directly, but make, make it clear that you care about them personally. So, so these are some of the rules for Radical Candor. You can read more on the Radical Candor website. Um, but if you don't take a, anything else away from, from this talk, I want you to take away that communication is a skill. It's one you can learn. <laughs> I believe in you because I've done it. I've, I'm a lot better than I used to be. Um, and these are some resources that can help you. Thanks. And I think I ended on time for questions. Yes, that's perfect timing. <laughs> yeah, communication <laughs> is as important as code and punctuality is as important as content. So I agree with you. <laughs> so, uh, so yes, so a few questions because we, uh, we talked about the Conway's law uh, earlier, the reverse Conway's law that the fact that what you build has impact on how you communicate, but also why how you communicate has impact on what you build and how you build mm -hmm. it, right? So I love the stories, you know, about your your partner and uh, uh, and you know, and I love the the the, the piece of code she wrote. And uh, if I if I if I would have a tattoo, that would be this one. Be one <laughs> but but yeah, so um, but like, what are you know? You talk about empathy. You talk about things that are uh, that sometimes we don't talk enough. In companies, right? We don't we don't talk enough. So how you can have some companies, for example, are pushing a, a culture about documentation or you know culture about not innovation, not fearing failure, but we don't talk enough about this this communication culture. So uh, yeah, how what would be the first step for a company to think that communication is as important as code? Yeah, so I think I think a lot of it comes down to you know asking why. Like so, if there's uh, a desire to improve the documentation. Well, why do you want to improve the documentation? Kind of like take a five whys exercise. Why do you want to improve the documentation? Uh, because it's hard to read. Why is it hard to read? 
uh, because the people writing it haven't been trained in how to write. Why haven't they been trained in how to write? Because we've never <laughs> trained them. Why haven't you trained them? We haven't thought it was important. So, I mean, you can really, like, you can really get into that. Like, well, so maybe we should think it's important to, to train people to, to write and communicate. Um, and, then, uh, and then perhaps that can lead to better documentation as a result. Um, you know, instead of it just, you know, kind of being an edict to say everyone needs to write better documentation, you know, it's like, well, what does that mean? That, you know, that can be, it can be difficult for an individual who's having to do the work to understand. Um, but then if you kind of peel back the layers and realize, oh, we, you know, our people need some training and what it means to communicate better, um, then you can kind of lift that, uh, lift that capability that way. Yeah, the, the five whys is a, is a great but horrible <laughs> exercise because it, it destroys everything. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> you know, but, but it's a, it's a great one. So, uh, you know, in, let's say um, in, in a lot of part of the world, especially in the Bay Area, you know, the, the Radical Condor, you know, had book had a lot of success, mm -hmm. uh, right? Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with the main concept, but yeah, let's say, uh, and also the fact that now with, you know, a lot of remote work, we need to communicate even more. Communication is Absolutely. even more important, right? So yeah, what and would be harder. the first <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's even harder. So in that context, uh, what advice could you give, you know, about implementing a communication, uh, a, a safe, inclusive, and empathetic communication culture? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I think something that we've, we've learned throughout the pandemic um, and with having so many teams who weren't used to having, you know, remote workforces suddenly having to work that way. You know, Corey Bytes, we've been 100% distributed for about eight years. So we had a lot of practice. Um, and, you know, some of the things that we've done is, you know, um, it's always acceptable to have your camera on. It's always accept, you know, like we, we just, we have a lot of ground rules that we're pretty clear about. It's always okay to eat. It's always okay if your kids come in the frame. It's always okay if your animal comes in the frame. Um, you know, none, of, no one's going to judge you based on how messy your background is. You know, there are just, you know, some, uh, so, some, some culture built around what's, what's acceptable there so that people don't feel like they can't show up and be themselves, uh, at, at work. Um, but then, you know, also if you don't want to have your camera on, then don't have your camera on, right? It's just, it's just no stress. It's just like, you know, I'm not feeling it today. I don't have my camera on. Just, that's okay. Uh, the rest of us are going to have us have our cameras on because we like to be able to make con eye contact or at least pretend we're making eye contact through a camera. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, that's how, how we prefer to communicate. Um, but I also think, you know, having empathy for the situation that people are in, uh, you know, so throughout the pandemic, even though we were distribu already a distributed team, we noticed the challenge that uh, families with parent, uh, families with children, uh, were encountering when their younger children didn't have childcare anymore. And you have two members of the household who are trying to work, and they're trying to work while they're also taking care of kids and teaching kids. And it's like, you know, now you've got three jobs. Um, and and then also for people who didn't have families and or you know, didn't have children and also didn't have a partner. They were completely isolated, alone in their in their homes, um, with nothing but work to keep them company. Uh, and you know, so the the emotional challenges for those two those two populations was very very different. And and the things that they needed and the support they needed from their employer was very different. So it's you know again you know, approaching that with empathy, recognizing where people are at, um, and trying to figure out like you know what you can do to help them. Yeah, it really, really reminds me in the last minute we have, but it really reminds me that, you know, the Agile Manifesto, like human inter interactions uh, over processes and tools, mm -hmm. right? It seems that we've seen that first, we've seen actually the Agile methodologies, right, working, you know, uh, the, the sprint, the iteration, you know, the ability to adapt more than following a plan, right? But we've seen also that more than ever, uh, software is a human is, is, is completely is completely human interactions uh, you know like the mythical man month or you know all these ideas uh, right uh, so the communication is part of the job and sometimes some people wants to reduce meetings and and again I'm, I'm not against that <laughs> but, the, <laughs> but communication is 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 part of the job yes whatever absolutely. written whatever synchronous synchronous or asynchronous yeah it's it's definitely part of the job and this is why we also wanted to have you uh, there uh, to 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 explain that to push that because the way you communicate tells probably about the way you work with others, right? Yeah, absolutely. And my business partner Andrea, who you know, uh, a lot of the inspiration for for what went into this talk, 
Um, she is working uh, on a book with a, with a co-author of hers, um, and the title of the book is Empathy Driven Software, Software Development, and it should be out sometime in the next year or so. I don't know how long it takes to write a book. Um, but <laughs> Yeah, but, but again, you know, we love books. You know, people who write books, we invite them to talk about them, and especially when it's about software. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, but it's funny. It's not test-driven development. It's not documentation-driven development. It's empathy-driven development. Empathy -driven. I love, yeah. and it tells a lot about you know the communication aspect uh, more than just the technical aspect. Awesome. Yeah, Scott, it was great to have you. Uh, right, really Thanks great. And uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, enjoy your day. I see some beautiful sun behind you.